Hello everyone and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Colorado School of Mines. I'm Eric. And I'm Leah. So far, we've talked about elastic diffraction and the scattering density, but we ended up with this nasty expression for the amplitude at the detector. Eric, somehow, I'm not really connecting this with reality. Okay, that's totally fair. To that end, let's start with something simple and build up from there. You've encountered Bragg's Law in other classes. What can you tell me about it? Well, Bragg's Law tells us about wave interference arising from successive platens of atoms. Something like this. Exactly, and as we change the angle of incidence, the only thing we change is the phase difference between successive lattice planes. Okay, this is critical for the rest of the video. By changing the source and the detector, you're changing whether or not you get constructive or destructive interference. So your point is that we can sweep the source and detector across a range of angles and create a diffraction pattern, which is simply a measure of the intensity for a given configuration. Yeah, the cool thing to note here is that Bragg's Law is a direct consequence of the fact that our lattice is periodic. But this picture looks a little wrong to me. Don't we have a cloud of electrons around each atom? And what about the bonds holding the crystal together? What happens when we look at these things using Bragg's Law? Well, let's replace our discrete atomic arrangement with more realistic atoms, which have a surrounding electron cloud. The underlying physics of constructive interference still holds, but this notion of discrete planes of atoms now gets pretty fuzzy. So instead, every region with non-zero scattering density within the sample will contribute to the interference pattern of the detector. It's a little easier to see now why we need a periodic scattering density to model a real-world sample. I'm betting that makes the math much cleaner. Right. So let's go ahead and insert the periodic scattering density we already derived into our equation for the amplitude of the diffracted beam at the detector. An important thing to notice is that we have combined the complex exponentials into one term. Okay, let's make some reasonable assumptions, namely that the crystal's volume is constant, the Fourier terms for the scattering density are also constant, and that we're not moving the crystal around in real space as we do our experiment. Okay. So what does that mean for our amplitude equation? I'm getting to that. You remember how we defined our scattering density as being periodic with t, and use that to define our reciprocal lattice g? Yeah. Okay, so the real space lattice t is invariant in time, since the crystal's just sitting there. So g is constant as well? Yeah. With these assumptions, the only thing left which can vary in our amplitude equation is delta k. And that's just relating the source and the detector to each other. Let's evaluate the equation for a couple of different delta k values. Okay, how about something easy to start? So what happens when we set delta k equal to some g naught value with a particular h k and l? As we do the summation, we're going to eventually run into a term where g equals g naught. Since delta k equals g naught, the exponent goes to 1 and the integral becomes fairly trivial. Visually, I like to think about that integral like this. What about the other terms? where g doesn't equal g naught. Let's expand the complex exponential and sketch a quick graph of the contribution of the amplitude from each part for a one-dimensional example with length l. Hey, that's weird. Most of the complex exponential wave cancels out, but there's a little tiny bit at the end which doesn't. Right, and the contribution from that tiny bit is pretty small when compared to the contribution from the g equals g naught term so we choose to ignore it and can instead approximate the amplitude as being proportional to ng times the volume. So what about the other situation? The other situation is when delta k never equals any g naught. In that case, we would never have this major contribution. Instead, we would only have the smaller terms contributing, so we never get a major diffraction peak. It seems like most of the time we're going to have destructive interference, and only every now and again will we encounter constructive interference. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, I'm following this, but remind me why I care about constructive interference? Okay, by analyzing what's required to achieve constructive interference, we should be able to infer something about our sample. If I can use delta k to map out g, I can identify the individual g1, g2, and g3. And if you know the reciprocal lattice factors, you know the real space lattice factors too. But Eric, if we have an unknown sample, we probably don't know anything about its g-values. That's right. Instead, we'll change delta k by moving the source and detector configuration, sweeping out our reciprocal space. We eventually build out the g-space for this crystal using this method. 
Here's what happens when you rotate the source and the detector simultaneously. So the k and k prime vectors are the same length because the scattering is elastic, but the magnitude of delta k can vary. Yeah, you've got it. Okay, it looks like it's about time for a recap. So today, we examined the diffraction equation in detail and made some assumptions which allowed us to simplify the amplitude of the diffracted wave to something a little more manageable. In the end, we found that constructive interference only occurs when delta k equals a g vector of the sample crystal. And this constructive interference is just a more robust approach to the concepts which underpin Bragg's law. Yeah, it's just about the difference in path lengths that the wave takes. Right. Next, we can start talking about different methods of using diffraction to probe our crystal structure. Thanks for watching Solid State Physics in a Nutshell. See you next time.